All right. Again, thank you all for being a part of these studies on tonight, Kingdom Family. Uh, this is our study, a little house cleaning. If your mics are not muted, go ahead and please mute your mic so that we don't get any feedback. Uh, again, let you know that these sessions are, in fact, being recorded. And if you'd like a copy of the recording, uh, see either uh, Brother Coffee or Brother Javier Frias, and they'll make sure uh, that these studies will get into your hand. Uh, you can study them later on. I'm going to ask you if you would grab your pen and paper, jot down the things that you're going to hear, let you know off the off the bat that I uh, I speak fast. I do try to cover a lot of information in a short amount of time. Uh, write your question down. There will be an opportunity for you to ask any questions, uh, make any concerns you have about anything that I say. And again, this is our study, and we can, I, I stand to be corrected. I want to make sure everybody understands that, okay? We want to hear what thus said the Lord from his word rightly divided, okay? All right, before we get started, I do want to have a prayer. And Brother Green, I want to impose on you, brother, to give us a prayer, if you don't mind, to get us started, please. Yes, sir. Let us go to God and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for watching over us last night as we slept and slumbered. And Heavenly Father, for through your will and power, allowed us to wake to see another day. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us throughout this day as uh, we, we live through. Heavenly Father, most of all, we thank you for seeing our Lord Jesus Christ, who you sent down to this cruel world to die for uh, our sins, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Ghost for all those who've obeyed the gospel that bring us into all truth and the seal to show that we belong to you. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you be with our teacher tonight, that you bring those things back to his recollection in which he has studied and that is rightly divided with no addition and subtraction. Heavenly Father, we pray for everyone that's here on the study tonight, the families that are represented. Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, whatever your will be, that it be done, Heavenly Father. And whatever it is, you know they stand in need of, Heavenly Father, that you give those them those things according to your will. Heavenly Father, we pray for the sick, and we pray for those that are going through bereavement right now. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you give them strength and comfort. And Heavenly Father, that um, you give them a reasonable portion of health. And, and Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all that you do. And we ask a... Uh, sins, everyone in word, thought, or deed, that you protect them from all hurt, harm, or danger that may come our way. And Heavenly Father, we ask for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, Heavenly Father, and that we apply those things to our lives that we read in your holy and divine word. And we ask you for strength and courage, Heavenly Father, to go out and share your word with all those that we may have opportunity to share it with. And Heavenly Father, we just pray as we go through this study that our, our minds be open and receptive to what's being taught in your word, Heavenly Father. And we just thank you and we give you glory and honor. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, uh, Brother Green, for that prayer. Tonight, I want to talk about the subject, what God wants uh, the married and the singles to know. What God wants the unmarried and the singles in the kingdom to know. You know, the Bible, brothers and sisters, before I get started in Genesis 1, has a lot to say uh, about single living. Uh, you may be at a congregation, and this is why I think subjects like this is important, where you may have a few singles, or you may be at a congregation that has, has a, a lot of, of singles. And I think uh, this is a subject, again, that needs to be talked about uh, uh, more often than perhaps it is. Uh, when we talk about the unmarried and we talk about the singles, that's, that's, that's in the church. Uh, I think a lot of us need to have a proper perspective uh, about those who are single uh, in the church and, and not married. You know, because too often what I find is we got people who are married. Uh, what they do is they look down on people who are single. And, and too many times we find in the church too many people are trying to play matchmaker. Uh, when they find or have somebody they know that is single in the church, or there are even some that that look down on singles with pity, as if you know marriage is the is the ultimate state uh, of life. And I want to make sure that you and I uh, look at unmarried and and singles from God's perspective, because God has a lot to say about this, and we want to talk about a little bit of this on tonight. And again, I don't claim to exhaust everything on this subject, but I do want to lay a foundation and then we can come back to it later on. Now let's begin in Genesis chapter one, and I want to read verse number 26 and verse 27 of Genesis chapter one, and I want to commence the reading at verse 26 and 27. The Bible says, and God said, 
let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, uh, he, him, forgive me, male and female created he them. And so we read this book of these verses from the book of Genesis that's penned by Moses. Now, I want you to understand when we read Genesis chapter one, what God has done through Moses, the spirit that is through Moses in chapter one has told us what God was going to do. When you read Genesis chapter two, Genesis two will tell us how God did it. I'm going to say that again. Genesis one is telling us what God did. When you get to Genesis 2, he's going to tell us and show us how God created male and female. So now when you get down to Genesis chapter 2 and you look with me in verse number 18, I want to read this verse first. Now listen at this, Genesis 2, 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help me for him, okay? And so when you read Genesis 2, God is showing us through Moses that uh, Adam hasn't has been made, but Adam does not have a help meet yet. And so I want you to see first and foremost that what God has done is he has created man, human, and the first human started out single. Now I want you to get that in your spirit. He, he started out single. God could have very well made Adam and Eve at the same time. That's not what God chose to do. God chose to make man, and he put Adam here, and Adam right now is without a wife. He was created, get this, he was created single. Now, when you look at verse 18, I want you to key in on that verse because notice God knows something about Adam. God knows, get this, the Lord said it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help me. You see that? So God created him single, and God knows, in verse 18, he knows that it's not good for man to be alone. But why is Adam alone? Well, because he's a single man, but Adam has to fulfill God's purpose while he's single. Now, what was his purpose? Now, go up to verse number 15. And the Lord God, Genesis 2, 15, and the Lord God took the man, put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden, you may you may as freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, you shall surely die. I love that those verses because these verses show us even though Adam's single, he still has the benefit of, of enjoying life. Before Eve is ever created. What God lets Adam know that you can have everything, you can freely eat, you can freely enjoy life as a single man. God makes me understand, but he also has to fulfill God's purpose in that. So in verse 18, it says, and the Lord God said, it's not good for the man uh, that he should be alone. I will make him a help me. Look at verse 19. And then out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. Here's, here's God's purpose for him. Every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, brought him unto Adam to see what he would call them. And what's over Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to all the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. Y'all see what God did here? God had him to do his work. God gave Adam a purpose. Adam, you're single, but you have a purpose while you're single. I need you to do something. Yes, I know it's not good for man to be alone, but you have a work, a purpose for me before I give you a spouse. Now look what happens in verse 21. And then the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now a bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now understand this, Adam didn't have a father or mother, a physical, biological. Adam or Eve did not have a father or a mother. And so you have to understand what I want you and I to see when it comes to being single, you have to understand if you're on here and are single, you have to understand that being single, you can still fulfill God's purpose. Yeah, I want you to get that. 
You, you, and our problem in our society is, brothers and sisters, and I'm talking about singles who are in the church, singles who are who are who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need to understand that first and foremost, you need to be concerned as a single fulfilling God's purpose in your life. That that's what you ought to be doing. If you're single, again, marriage isn't the, 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 the all state of everything, you know, and again, we got to get this mentality out of our mind that just because a person is, is not married, they can't fulfill and they can't be joyful. That's not true. You can be joyful. You can be fulfilled if you are single. And if you are single, what you need to be concerned about is fulfilling your purpose while you are single. Okay. And I hope we get that in our spirit. The most the most greatest relationship that humankind should be concerned about is the relationship you have with God. Am I fulfilling my purpose, whether you're single or married? Am I fulfilling my purpose with God? Is my relationship right with God? That's what you ought to be concerned about above everything else. So don't let people tell you, well, and have pity on you because you may not be married because you're single. So you need to maximize what you can do for God as a single while you may be anticipating a spouse. Again, nothing wrong if you don't have that gift, nothing wrong with a desire uh, to have a spouse. But at, at the end of the day, if you don't have one, you need to be maximizing maximizing what you can do for God while you are single. God's purpose. You know what that means? Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 if you are single. That means you need to be living right. That's what you need to be doing. You need to not be sleeping around, and you need to be fleeing anything that's sin, fleeing fornication. That's what you ought to do. Why? Because you know that's not what God would have you to be doing. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 20, when Paul writes to young Timothy, and verse number 20, listen to this, but in a great house, and again, we're talking about kingdom families. Now, let me stop here before I read verse 20, y'all, while y'all turn there. When we're talking about kingdom family, the word kingdom really means rule. That's what the word kingdom means, rule. We're saying kingdom families. In other words, we rule, God rules. God should rule your life if you're in the kingdom, whether you're single or whether you're married. God rules, whether you're a parent or whether you're a child. Kingdom families. We understand that we're in God's kingdom and God rules our life. So we're in his house. And when we're in his house, we ought to know how to behave ourselves, whether you're single or whether you're married. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul says, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Look what he tells Timothy in verse 22. Flee also youthful lust. But here's what you need to follow after. Follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. What is he telling Timothy? God's purpose. That's what you ought to be about, Timothy. If you're a, a servant of God and as a single man, you need to be concerned about God's purpose, not your purpose and not the peer pressures of the world. Because again, the world will try to peer pressure those who are single into, into getting married because they think if you're not married, some believe if you're not married, something's wrong with you. And a lot of people spend their time uh, having pity on themselves, wondering what's wrong with me. Nobody wants me. Uh, nobody likes me. I'll talk about that a little later. But at the end of the day, you have to understand if you have a relationship with God, there is nothing wrong with you. Make sure you get that in your spirit. If you have a relationship with God, you should be living your life to fulfill God's purpose and don't worry about the pressures of the world. Because at the end of the day, your relationship with God will last longer than your, your marital relationship. Go to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Luke 14. Luke chapter 14. Is why, brother, says to be a disciple of Jesus, you got to love Jesus. You've got to love God more than you even love your own self. In Luke chapter 14, verse 25 and verse 26, uh, verse 25 and 26, Jesus here is going to talk about the cost of discipleship. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and he said unto them, if any man come to me and hate not his father, that means love them less. 
his father, his mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Do y'all see that in Luke 14, 25, 26? He didn't say you're a bad disciple. He didn't say you're a mediocre disciple if you don't love them less. Jesus says, if you don't love them less than me, you cannot be my disciple. It's amazing how many folk that I've talked to who love their wife and their children more than they love the Lord. And you know, these relationships we have down here are temporal. I hope everybody understands that. It's why in your marriage vow, you say it's sickness and in health and for richer or for poor. And then you also say until death do us part. That's what you say, because marriage is not the end all. And you and I have got to get that in our spirit. OK, and so I want to make sure we you and I, we understand that, brothers and sisters. God, let me say this. God, God gives people desires. You and I, the desires that we have come from God, the desire to eat. Uh, the desire to drink, the desire for companionship. Why does God give us those desires? God gives us those desires in the physical. I want you to get this. He gives you and I those desires in the physical because that's how we should seek him in the spiritual. I'm going to make sure you get that. We should hunger and thirst for God like you hunger and thirst for food and water. That's what it, you should, as you hunger and have that desire for the opposite sex, God says, I want you to desire me, have that type of intensity when it comes to your spiritual relationship with me. So you and I have got to learn to allow God to control your desires. Again, sex is not wrong until it's done out of the confines of God's will. Eating is not wrong and drinking is not wrong until it's done outside of the confines of God's will. Please get that in your spirit. So God gives you and I desires so that we can be righteous, so that we can have peace and joy in our lives. But that cannot be done if he's not in the equation. Please get that in your spirit as well. So when talking about singles and people desiring to get married, I'm going to tell you, you singles need to first and foremost be concerned about, do you have a, found, a, a sound foundation with God? Because if you get married to the wrong person, then what they can do is they can pull your heart away from God. Now, go to 1 Kings chapter 11. This happened to the wisest man, uh, one of the wisest men on earth, and that's Solomon. Go to 1 Kings. First Kings chapter 11. See, that's why first and foremost, your greatest relationship is your relationship with God, not getting a spouse, a husband or wife. You need to be concerned, is my relationship right with God? Because if it's right with God, then you won't allow your husband or your wife or your children to pull you away from your relationship with the God, with the God you love and serve. Now, in first Kings chapter 11, but it can happen. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 11, listen to it happened to Solomon, who we've been studying in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Thank God he fixed it and got it right. But listen at his experience before that. But King Solomon loved many strange women. Together with his daughter, with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, you shall not go into them. Neither shall they come in to you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And the Bible says Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wise princesses and 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart. Y'all see that? He married people he should not have been married to based upon the law he lived under. He married these people. And what did they do? Just like God said, they turned his heart away from God. Now look at verse four, for it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the god of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he also, or did he for all his uh, strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrifice unto their gods. And verse 9 says, and the Lord was angry. 
angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. What I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, is marriage should not change your relationship with God. What, what, what God wants us to know, brothers and sisters, is if you have Christ, you are complete. You have to, you have to, every single need to see them. Every single needs to see themselves that way. If you have Christ, I am complete. Now, again, I'm going to talk about marriage. Nothing wrong with marriage. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Go to Colossians chapter 2. For Colossians chapter 2, and I'm going to read 8 through 10. And when I'm talking about you're complete, I'm talking about you need to see yourself as, first of all, being complete spiritually. I am complete spiritually with Christ if I have him. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 8. Paul says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Now, I love this verse, especially in the context I'm talking about it. You know, people deceive you. Well, if you're not married, something must be wrong with you. If you're not married, uh, it must be your attitude. And, you know, you and I cannot fall for that philosophy, the philosophy, the philosophy of men. He said, after the, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him, this is what Paul says, in him, in Christ, Dwell in all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. You see that? That's how you have to see yourself as a as a sink. Yo, know, you know, I got I got keys here. And this is what I'm saying to every single. Here's a keys. Two, two keys. One, one here is a one here is a house key. And one is a one is a uh, a car key, and both of them are on a ring. Now, if I took one of these keys off, is it still a complete key? Does it still fulfill its purpose because it's not on the ring? Absolutely, absolutely. So does this key. This key will still, even though it doesn't have a ring, and it's not with the other key, it's still complete. It'll still start my car. It'll still turn off the alarm. Why? Because it's complete. I don't know why people think that because you're single, you can't be complete if you got God. Just because you put, see, sometimes what's happening is we got too many singles. Here's what we have. We have a bunch of singles who don't see themselves complete unless they have a spouse, unless they're married. And so what you have and what we see even in the church is we see two people who don't feel they're, they're, they're complete. So you got two incomplete people that are getting together because they don't have a relationship with God. How is that working? So what you have to understand, brothers and sisters, is if I'm single, I need to know and see myself if I have a relationship with God that I am complete, even though I don't have a ring. You have to see yourself as that. And stop allowing the philosophy and the traditions of the world to tell you and I anything different than that. And so we look at the Bible, we look at the text, marriage doesn't define you. It, it, I'm going to say that again. Marriage does not define you. Go to 1 Corinthians 7. Go to 1 Corinthians 7 with me. Marriage doesn't define you. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 32. It's a blessing from God if you are married, but it'd it be a blessing from God if you're not married. Now, Paul was not married. He wrote the majority of the New Testament. Anybody on here say Paul was a loser? My goodness. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 32. 1 Corinthians 7 32. This is what he said. But I would have you without carefulness. He said, I will have you not to be anxious, Paul says. 1 Corinthians 7 32. He that is unmarried, carry for the things that belong to the Lord. How he may please the Lord. Y'all see that? In other words, if you're single, you need to be doing what the Lord, what the Lord will have you to do. That's what you need to be doing. You have more time than those who are married to be about God's business, to be about doing what God would have you to do. Now, let me say this. It's not a sin uh, to get married. If you're single, not a sin, it, it, but it's not a sin either to stay single if you've been married before and don't want to get married. Now, make sure you understand that if you don't have a desire 
after you've been married before to get married again and can, can be sanctified, then you're good with that. You can be about doing more for the Lord if you decide to be that kind of eunuch. Look at, uh, remember Anna, go to Luke chapter two. Remember Anna? Let's go to Luke two. There was a prophetess in the Bible named Anna. Go to Luke chapter two. Let me show you this. Nothing wrong with you because you decide to stay single and work for the Lord. There's going to be some single people that, that don't have to be sinning, uh, you know, and, and, and cutting up. Uh, just because they single, you know I mean, you got to stop judging people's heart, brothers and sisters. I'm going to tell you, we got to get out of that foolishness. I think every single man got to run around and, and cheating, uh, uh, on, you know, and, and, and committing fornication and adultery. Luke chapter 2, and look at verse 36. Here's a woman uh, who was married for a short length of time, and she stayed single for, I mean, yeah, single for a long length of time, a widow. The Bible says in Luke 2, 36, Bible says, and there was uh, one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score and four years, 84 years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayer night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spoke of him to all them that looked for redemption at Jerusalem. So she was there when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus into the temple at his birth. But I want you to hone in on the fact that this woman stayed single and she was about the Lord's business as a single woman. Okay, please understand that. So if you have that gift and you don't have that desire uh, to, to get married after you have I've been married before, then by all means, you can you can stay single and you can you can you can do the Lord's you can do the Lord's work. OK, and I want to make sure that we get that. Go to Matthew 19. Give me about five more minutes. Ma Matthew 19, Matthew chapter 19. Now, I want I want to say this. You know, uh, there are some people that can stay celibate and stay single and be about the Lord's business. Please get that in your spirit. And so what I'm telling you and I who are married, stop trying to play matchmaker in the church uh, with every single that you see trying to hook people up like you Chuck Woolery, love connection, and make sure that the people you're trying to hook somebody up with want to be married. They might not want to be married. Stop looking at single people as if something's wrong with them. And while I'm in that neighborhood, let me say this too, since I'm just this just brainstorming. Those of you parents that's on here that are telling your children where my grandbaby's at and they ain't even married, you need to cut that foolishness out too. Oh, when well, I'm going to get my little grandson and then you know he or she ain't even married. How about when you're going to get a daughter-in-law or son-in-law? How about that first? Some of us got this worldly mindset. It just baffles me. And we wonder why the church is sinking. In areas that shouldn't be, because we spewing foolish about our mouth. Where is my grandson and my granddaughter? What about where your where your daughter in law and your son in law? How about that first? Are they married? And we got to stop all this foolishness going on in the church and then celebrate again. Nothing wrong. I'm gonna say this too. I'm out on the limb. I'm going all the way out. Need I'm gonna stop. We need to stop this too. Now again, nothing wrong when people do with a child that's had out of wedlock. But I'm going to tell you something. We need to start making sure we stand up and tell uh, little Johnny and, and little Susie that they shouldn't have had a baby out of wedlock. You should have gotten married. We're going to love the baby. We will have a baby shower, but you got to stop that sin. All right. No, I said something. Now, go to Matthew 19 and look at verse number. I want to look at verse number uh, verse number eight. Let's just start there. And I'm going to but give you the context. Jesus is, is, is having a conversation with these with these the, the, these lawyers, Pharisees, who are tempting him uh, about uh, about marriage. Is it OK to get married uh, after you've been divorced? So I'll just pick up in verse number seven. They said to him, why did Moses then command to give a right of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, 
suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning he says it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, shall be for fornication, shall marry another. He says, committed adultery. Whosoever married her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now look at verse 10. His disciples said to him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to be married. Now that's what they're saying. See, they're saying that if a person gets a divorce and uh, it was for a reason other than fornication and they got remarried and it's called adultery, they're saying it's not good to get married. Jesus don't agree with that statement because Jesus is going to say uh, in verse 11, but he said unto them, all men cannot receive this saying, save to whom it is given. Now, listen what's going on here because I'm going to slow down because some people may not know what's being done or said here. If a person's been married, because God's law is one man, one woman for life. If a person, a marriage has been dissolved for a reason other than fornication, when that man or that woman gets married, their other marriage is called an adultery. That's what it's called. Why? Because it was broken for a reason other than fornication. Please get that. The Bible never says you can't get married again after that. Please understand that as well. So when Jesus says this, these guys say, well, if I get a divorce for a reason other than that and get remarried, it's adultery. Well, it's better not to get married. God says, no, everybody can't receive that saying, except he's been given. What does he mean? Everybody don't have that gift to stay celibate. And he's going to explain that here in just a few minutes. Because he says in verse 12, for there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. Y'all see that? There were some people that were born from their mother's womb without a desire for another individual, okay? There was people that were born that way. That's a gift, like Paul. Paul says he had that gift to not desire the opposite sex. Everybody don't have that gift. Remember, God is the one that gives desires, brothers and sisters. Please get that in your spirit. God gives desires. That's who gives desire. God did. And so everybody don't have that gift. And so he says, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. So then you have people like the Ethiopian eunuch we study in Acts 8, where there were, were times where kings and queens would castrate the male so that he wouldn't mess with the harem. So he wouldn't mess with the, 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 the harem. So they were made eunuchs by other men. And so then you have, and you have, uh, and I said that about the Ethiopian eunuch, and I'm just saying that perhaps is how he was a eunuch. Make sure we, we get that. He was a eunuch of the queen of, of Ethiopia, Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. And so then we have the other group, which have made themselves eunuchs. You see that, verse 12? Made themselves eunuchs. Why? For the kingdom of heaven's sake. There are some people who decide, like Anna, who decided, you know what? I don't want to have an opposite set. I'm going to make myself a eunuch and not want to be with the other set. And I can do that without sinning. I don't want to be without. I don't want another man. I don't want another woman. If you're if, if, if you're a man, he said, and you can do that for the kingdom's sake. And then Jesus says, he that is able to receive it, let him receive it. So now if you're able to live your life single without sinning, you have more time to be concerned about your relationship with God. If you can receive that, then he says, receive it. It doesn't make you less of a person because you are a single individual. Just make sure you're not sinning, okay? Now, let me give you something real quick, four things real quick. I'm gonna give them quick. Uh, I want you to see this, four things about singles. I want singles to know. First of all, single, if you're single, it's a gift from God as well as marriage is. I'm going to say that again. If you're single, it is a gift from God, just like, just like marriage is. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7. Why is it a gift? Well, it's a gift because, again, as we already mentioned, you can spend your time uh, in doing what God wants you to do. If you can, if you're a single person, don't need another mate like Paul, yeah, you know, that's a gift from God. I mean, you can work more in his kingdom and do more things than you can do if you were married. He says in verse seven, look what Paul says, for I would that all men were even as I myself. Now listen what he says, but every man had his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. You see that? It's a gift from God. You know, again, as I said, 
physical marriage isn't the ultimate state, brothers and sisters. It's your spiritual marriage. Are you married to Christ as male and female? Are you spiritually married to Christ? That's what's important. Secondly, secondly, single singles uh, have its advantage. If you're single, you, you, you it has its advantages. Go to uh, for, drop down, y'all. Seven First Corinthians seven. Drop down to verse twenty-eight. Verse twenty-eight. Paul says, and the context of this is, is a present distress going on. In the context, I want to make sure we keep it in context. The context is you had some questioning, is it good for a man to be with a woman? And Paul is breaking down, you know, the marriage law for those who are who, who are unmarried, whether you're uh, unmarried because of divorce or unmarried because of death, a widow. Or maybe you're unmarried because you have never been married. The word unmarried is four times in the Bible, and it always means this. Hold on, I'm going to tell you. The word unmarried is found four times in the New Testament. And here's what it always means. You ready? Unmarried. And that's something. That's what it always means. Unmarried. If you're not married, you're unmarried. OK, or or you're, you're a virgin. You've never been married before. You're still unmarried. Now, look at this. Verse 28. Now, Paul tells him, but, and if you marry, he says, you have not sinned. And if a virgin married, she had not sinned. Nevertheless, now listen what he says, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. You know, I'm going to say that marriage is work. I don't care whether you're Christian or not a Christian. Marriage is work. Why? Because it's going to take some time. It does. Uh, you have to spend time. You got to do God's work, but then you got you got physical work to do. If you if you have children, you have to spend time teaching your children. You have to spend time with your husband. You have to spend time with your wife. That's what you're going to have to spend time with. But if you're single, you're more free. That's the idea Paul is bringing bringing about. Drop down to verse 32 of the same chapter, First Corinthians seven. Look with me in verse 32. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried, cared for the things that belong to the Lord how he may please the Lord. But he that is married cared for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cared for the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married cared for the things of the world, get this, how she may please her husband. You see that? And so if you're single, it has some advantages to it. If you don't have that desire for another spouse, you can do more in your relationship with God. Thirdly, thirdly, singles, I want to do this to the singles, unmarried. It, 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 singleness is, is hard if you don't have the gift. I want you to understand this. It's hard if you don't have the gift. Now go to 1 Corinthians 6 and 18. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Paul, back earlier, before chapter 7, he tells him, he tells him this. He says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth without the body, but he that committed fornication, you sin against your own body. Now, let me tell you something. If you're on here single, you need to know how to control yourself. Now, and you need to be looking for a spouse. You need to be talking with God. And you need to be doing what you can. Make sure you get this. This man or this woman, if you don't have that desire uh, to stay single, this man or this woman, this husband or wife you're looking for, ain't going to just come. God is not going to lay you down like he did Adam and take your rib and he's going to create you a spouse. Please understand that. What you're going to have to do if you're single and you have this desire, you're going to have to go out there and let people know I am single and I'm looking. That's what you do. And I'm talking man and woman. You need to do that. Some of y'all, so I'm going to say this, I'm, like I'm already out there. Some of you women fall into this, this cultural idea that I'm going to just wait on him to ask me. Uh, and I'm just going to see if he going to ask me. But yet in your mind, you know, you have this. I don't know. And, and just like men look at pornography, women do it too. I'm just make sure you get that. The men on that, on that, on that pornography are not sleeping with themselves. They, there's women. They practice pornography, own pornography, just like the men. So what I'm telling you, women and men, you need to let people know I'm available. Open your mouth and talk. That's what you do. 
Go to them. Hey, do you mind taking me out? Would you like to go out and get to know each other? Can we go out on a date? Yeah. Can we can we talk? Uh, I'm going to cook dinner. And can you want to come over? Something like with no sin. But you need to let somebody know that I am looking. I am available and I'd like to talk to you. Make sure you get that. Too many of us, and it, let me say this while I'm in the neighborhood, and it don't have to be a Christian. Now, it, it, you ought to want a Christian. You ought to look for a, a Christian. But if you don't have a Christian, somebody who is nice, somebody that you can marry, that you know, because I have a strong relationship with God, I will be able to not leave God if I got in a relationship with a person that's not a Christian. Some of you may find yeah, it may be better in some cases, for you to marry somebody who might not be a Christian than those who are in the church cutting up. Because we got some in there who've been in the water and acting worse than those in the world. Just saying. Now, and so what you need to do is you need to let them know I'm available, whether you are male or a female. And while you do it, know how to control your vessel. Go to 1 Thessalonians 4. My guy got one more point, but it, I'm, I'm still on number three. And then got one more. Go to 1 Thessalonians 4. Paul writes to all Christians, you need to know how to control yourself. Control yourself. Stay off the pornography. Uh, stop the self, uh, the, the, the self-ordinate affection, the inordinate affection, pleasing yourself, self-gratification. That is a sin. I'm make sure everybody gets that. It is a sin when you're when you're doing that. First Corinthians, uh, first Thessalonians chapter four. We don't want to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. That's what it needs to be talked about because too much foolishness is going on in the world and it's coming right into the church. I'm opening up a question in a minute. Now, I want you to listen to what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4 when he's writing to Christians. He says, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you've received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. Now listen to what he said. He's going to give what give us what the will of God is. People are going, well, what's the will of God for my Well, Here's one of them. He says, even your sanctification that you should abstain from fornication. Y'all see that? God's will is you abstain from fornication. Listen to this. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. He talking about your private parts. Yes, he is. Your body. You need to know how to control your vessel. Not in the lust of concupiscence. Now, in other words, not running around being nasty. Even as the Gentiles, which knew not God, like you perhaps you were doing before you obeyed the gospel. Don't leave it there. He says that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God had not called us unto uncleanness, is what he called us to, but unto holiness, okay? And so you have to sanctify your heart. I've got to sanctify my heart, brothers and sisters. Stay away from filthiness and uncleanness and, and, and evil concupiscence is the idea of what Paul is saying. And so for singles, it's hard. It's hard. But if you don't have the gift, and so what you have to do is you have to walk by faith. But but works, uh, faith without works, rather, is dead. Please understand that. Faith without works is dead. Again, if you want a spouse, you need to be looking for a spouse. You have to be looking. Not going to come knocking on your door. Hey, God sent me. Now, you ain't going to see that. You got to be out there. Okay, number four, singleness like marriage isn't permanent. This is what I want us all to know. Singleness like marriage is not permanent. These are temporary relationships. Go to Mark chapter 12 and I'm done. Mark chapter 12. So I want to talk about this because if you're only a single, don't feel bad about yourself because you are. Look, down. Use the days God given you, you know, while you anticipate a spouse to still be about God's business. That's what you ought to be doing. Don't think less of yourself and don't let the world make you less, feel less than a, a complete person if you're in Christ. In Mark chapter 12 and verse 25, again, I just want to show you that, you know, these are temporary relationships, brothers and sisters. It is temporary. There's not going to be any marriage in heaven. You're not going to be looking for where my wife at, where my children, and none of that's in heaven. These are temporary relationships, temporary desires. 
In Mark chapter 12, let's let's see where I want to pick up with. Let's just start in verse number. Uh, let's start with 18, because I'm going to just show you the context. But I really want verse 25. Listen at 18. Then came unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. They asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, if a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now, there were seven brethren. I think they got Jesus in the catch 22. Now, there were seven brethren. And the first took a wife and dying, he left no seed. He left no children. And the second took her and died, neither left her or left he any seed. And the third likewise. And the seven had her and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. Now listen to this. They're going to ask him a question. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. You see their ignorance? See, the reason they ask this question because they don't believe in a resurrection, first and foremost. So they think, because they're carnal-minded, they think they got Jesus in the catch-22. This woman been married seven times, had no children from any of these brothers, and so whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection, if you believe in a resurrection? Now, this is what Jesus' response was. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Do you not, or he said, Do you not therefore err, because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God? For when they shall rise from the dead. They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. Y'all see that? And so I'm telling the singles, marriage isn't permanent. It's not the end all state, as many in our world society believe that it is. And so this is what God wants you to know. If you're married or you're unmarried, if you have the gift, stay single. That's what you so choose. Live your life and live it for God, doing the right thing and, and do more in the kingdom. Uh, but if you desire to be married, you're single and you're looking for a spouse, you want a spouse, you can't You can't contain. It's better than marry than to burn. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5 tells us that. It's better than marry, but you have to get out there, make yourself accessible and trust God will give you favor when you have a heart for God. Now that I believe. Proverbs 18, 22 says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. I'm going to say that again. Proverbs 18, 22, my memory serving right. He that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtaineth favor from the Lord. So if you're in good grace with God and you're giving your love to God, let me do what God will do. He knows what you need. God knows what you need. He put the desire in you. And if you're putting God first, God and you doing what you're supposed to do will allow you and your mate to meet. Please understand that because God came to save life. He doesn't want to destroy life. And God will find, he will, he will help you to fulfill the desire of your heart. Give and it shall be given unto you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall man give into your bosom. Well, measure you meet, it says it shall be measured to you again. So you need to give. You know, I think about Ruth, you know, Ruth and Naomi. You know what? You know what Ruth did? Ruth, when, when Ruth and Naomi, both of their husbands died in the book of Ruth, both of their husbands ended up dying. But what, what Ruth did is Ruth gave herself to Naomi. Both of them don't have husbands. But because Ruth had a heart for God, she was willing to give of herself. You know what she ended up getting? She ended up getting a husband. <laughs> she ended up getting a Boaz because she had a heart for Naomi's God. And I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, that's the same God you and I serve. God knows what you need. And God knows through his providence and your faith, how to maneuver and how to put things in the right place in order to meet the desire that you need met if you want to do his will. And that's the God I serve, and I know it's the God you serve. Let's pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, thank you so much, dear God, for your word. It's so powerful. Uh, Father God, we just need your wisdom. Just help us to navigate ourselves through this life, trusting you, Father, with all our heart, mind, and soul. I pray for every every, every single on this Zoom page, every parent who has single children, that, they, that we would teach them, Father God, uh, the importance of having a relationship with you. And, and Father, that's what matters at the end of the day. 
If that relationship with you is solid, if they seek the kingdom of God and your righteousness first, as Matthew 6.33 says, everything else, Father, will be added unto us. Help us to read and believe. For those of us who are married, pray to God that we don't always want to be matchmakers. I uh, pray that we don't look down on singles, uh, ask them what's wrong with them, because it very well may be nothing wrong. But just help us, dear God, to just use the words of wisdom from your book uh, to give wise counsel. And every case is different, dear God. And I pray that all of us understand that. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. And this prayer we offer is in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. This time I'm going to open it up for any questions, even if it doesn't pertain to what we discussed tonight. Any Bible questions or comments? I can't see everybody. Let me see everybody. Any any question or comment? Any questions? Any questions, comments? All right. Yes, go ahead, Coach V. Oh, okay, great. All right. So this is what I want to know, brother. I would like to know um, and the statement that God made in the book of Genesis when he said it's not good for a man to be alone. Are we saying, according to what we read in the scripture, because, you know, the scriptures must always harmonize. Are you saying, Brother Stevens, that um, as long as you have the gift, then it is good for you to be alone? because you have the gift. But if you don't have the gift, it's not good for you to be alone because that statement was made in Genesis where God said, it's not good for man to be alone. Or just help me understand that scripture and what you just presented from yeah. the New yeah. Testament. Well, there, yeah, thank you. Let's go fine. back. Yeah, great, great. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to remember, remember Adam, go back to Genesis chapter, chapter two, when Adam is naming the animals at the end of the day, He's he's concerned about not having anybody compatible. Now go look at verse verse number twenty one. So remember, he as he's fulfilling God's purpose again. And this is the key: fulfilling God's purpose. God created Adam, and so God put in Adam the desire, and and Adam by having this desire and understanding he gonna need a mate is still gonna fulfill God's will because the earth world's got to be populated. God, and so God instills in Adam his purpose. So God, Adam understands, God knows it's not good because God has a purpose for creating man and God knows how he's going to do it. It's going to be through a male and a female. So look at verse uh, chapter two and look verse number 20 again. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and the fowl of the air and to every beast of field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet, a help meet for him. And so as he's naming all these cattle and, and giving them names by the authority God gives him, God understands that it's not good that that he should be alone because when God, when he's naming animals, he's naming male and female. Every animal he named had a an opposite sex. That's the point I'm making so that this world, as we know, it could be populated. And so it was God that said in this text, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him uh, uh, help me. And I'm going to tell you something. Adam wasn't disappointed about it either because when God woke him up. After cutting him, he said, whoa, man, I'm going to tell you that. Well, I don't know how she, but he said, this is woman. He's happy. He's excited about this marriage, this relationship that was instituted by, by God. And so the, the, the idea is if you have the gift uh, to be single and you want to, you don't want to be married. Again, I don't think it's a sin either way. If you have the gift and you want to get married, get married. Uh, and, uh, but if you if you have the gift to 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 stay single, and you want to do more for the Lord, then do more for the Lord. At the end of the day, marriage is a choice. I'm gonna say this again: marriage is a choice unless unless you still practice in sin. Now make sure you get that. Unless you practice in sin, you need to be praying to God. And uh, and talking with God and getting yourself on the market, amen, on the market to be looking for a spouse of the opposite sex. Because you know you don't have to get because you're sinning everywhere. Please understand. You laying down with everybody you meet. Or you even, even if you're not laying down physically. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 32, whoever look it on a woman. That's vice versa too. A woman or a man. Whoever's looking on them to lust after them. 
you committed adultery with him in your heart. I'm going to read it, Matthew 5, 32. So you'll know who you are. Believe me, you'll know whether or not you're the person, you're not a candidate with the gift. You'll know. Matthew 5, 31, 32. It won't be hidden and you won't be lying to nobody but yourself because you know what you're doing behind closed doors. And all that, what happened in Vegas stays in Vegas. No, God, God knows what's going on in Vegas too. Now, in Matthew 5, 32, let me find this here. Verse 30, uh, no, not 32. Go to 27, I think. Uh, let me find it here. Matthew chapter 5, and look with me in verse number 27. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, you should not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looking on a woman, to lust after her had committed adultery with her already in his heart. Do y'all see that? So you don't have to be doing the physical act. You can be lusting, pornography, like I said. But no, you know you don't have the gift. Uh, inordinate affection. You, 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 you're killing the burn by, uh, by your own affection. In other words, you, I'm just trying to having conjugal comfort with yourself. I'm just trying to, I don't know who all is listening, but I just, y'all know what I'm talking about. And so you know that you don't have that gift to stay celibate. And so you need to be out there trying to find a mate. That's what you need to be doing. Okay. So I hope that helps. You wouldn't be a sin either way. If you got the gift and still get married and can still fulfill your marital duties, make sure you get that. That's why I need maybe to do a part two. Because if you get married, there are some marital duties. You can't get married and say, well, I got the gift. Ain't nothing happening tonight. No, then you you are the one that need to stay single. Make sure you get that. You're the one that needs to stay single. If you're a woman who can't be submissive to a husband, you're the one that needs to stay single. If you can stay single and, and, and not have to have that desire, then, then you stay single if you're not going to be submissive. Please understand that. If you're a man who can't provide for a woman, you need to stay single. Amen, because there's responsibilities. There's responsibilities that come with it. Now, whether you When you get married, on both parts, please get that. So if you know you ain't that person, and, and uh, then you, you stay single until you can fix yourself. But you can't get married and tell me, hey, I'm selling. I got the gift. Uh, no, what, what do you mean you got the gift? No, that comes with this. Man, we got to do something about this. Because let me give a scripture. Well, oh, yeah, because I want to give, go to 1 Corinthians 7. Somebody say, well, where'd he get that from? Let's read. I got to read back up what I'm saying. Go to 1 Corinthians 7 real quickly. 1 Corinthians 7. All this in the Bible, brothers and sisters. Don't be mad at me. Listen to what he says here. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. This is what he says. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. Let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband, now listen to this, let the husband render unto the wife do benevolence and likewise also the wife under the husband. Y'all know what do benevolence is. The wife had not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband had not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud you not one the other except it be with consent for a time. I always say this, you can rape your wife, men. If she says no, that means no. Please understand that. I'm going to say that again. You can rape your wife. If she said, and you shouldn't, I'm make sure i going to make sure I make this very clear. I'm not saying you can rape your wife, do it. I'm saying it is possible for a man to rape his wife, and you should not do it. When she says not tonight, no, that's what that means, N-O. Now, what he's teaching us, however, in the scripture is, you should not be using your body as a weapon to get what you want. Now, people that play that game, that's a worldly mindset. If you don't buy me that car, mm -mm, ain't nothing happening tonight. No action tonight. Not until he get that ring or she, you know, he give me that ring. And vice versa, men, same thing. Oh my mom, um, she ain't cook. Ain't nothing happening tonight. She know I, I wanted them hamburgers. She ain't, mm -mm. you can't do that. All right. So he says, defraud you not one another, except be for for time, that you may give yourself the fast and prayer and come together again. Why? That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. In other words, your lack of self-control. It's a spiritual battle. So don't defraud your 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 body. Don't don't hold back your body from your spouse. There are responsibilities and duties. 
All right. Hope that answered the question. Uh, uh, Sister Kennedy. Hey, I had a question uh, within marriage. Does does the Bible say anything about uh, pregnancy prevention within marriage? Is that something that is OK to do? I think that's a choice. Uh, that people can, I'm trying to see what, if I, what scripture I could, I, I think it's a, it, it would fall under a liberty, uh, unless somebody else got something else, like I said, it's our study, but I think that, uh, through, through wisdom, uh, and, and of God's word and, and that you have that liberty, uh, to be able to make that choice, uh, whether or not whether or not you want to bear more children. I don't see a scripture that, that would tell me that, that every time I am intimate with my spouse, that this possibility of pregnancy has to take place. I don't see a scripture that says that. Uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, the, the seed and the men have the seed uh, and the egg has to be fertilized, so it takes two. So the seed is not necessarily the child. The life comes at conception, and when when the seed and the and the eggs meet. And so I don't see any scripture that that says that it's sinful uh, uh, for somebody to use what we call birth control, and that, that's what we're talking about: birth control uh, in 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 a marriage. You can't support a child. You can't take care of children. Some of us don't need to have no more children. Amen. I know I said something again there too. Some people don't need any children, uh, can't can't take care of yourself, and then bringing other children in the world, and you can't support them. Anybody got uh, brother Kenny? You had your, something to add to that? Yeah, um, I just wanted to add. I don't, so I don't, I don't think I've ever found anything to to um, that really goes into that. However, I just think that, that that's like a communication thing, where you know, I, I think it would be wrong for a guy to fix himself um, and not have a conversation with his wife knowing that maybe she want more kids, but then I had that conversation. And the same thing, vice versa, the woman, you know, getting herself tied up to tied, and not having that conversation with the husband, it just creates, that would be the creation of uh, some a, a, a level of distrust and, you know, betrayal where all we have to do is speak it out. Now, we don't have that issue. She, that was just the question she asking. We just want to make sure that everybody get that in their spirit. But yeah. God bless you, Brother Kennedy. <laughs> uh, 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 brother Leroy, I see your hand. Uh, yeah, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, brother Bob was coming about this. Now, I just hopped on kind of late. But when the Bible says, be true for a multiply, and we talk about God's commandment, and we do talk to and uh, FEMA, the Sands of Towns, the Tubes, whatever, isn't that breaking God, God's commandment when he said, be true for a multiply? Yeah, but that was that was to Adam. You know, when you go, let's go back and look at it. That was he wanted them. No, it wasn't just Adam. Yeah, it was to Adam, but uh, huh? it was to um, more than just Adam. I do believe that? Okay, where is it at? Where was that more to Adam? Oh, I would have to find out where it's at. Yeah, you can find. I'm, where I'm doing a lot of studying right now, but I do know it says be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. It and, does. And when we talk about being fruitful, multiply. That's what God wants us to do. Yeah, but at the end of the day, you know, God, this is what we understand. There is no life without God. There are a lot of people that come together and want babies and can't have babies. I want to make sure everybody gets that. Exactly. Yeah, there are a lot of people come together and don't have babies uh, and want babies. At the end of the day, we understand God is the giver of life. But what I'm saying is with your body, your body, a woman's body, a man's body, if they choose to have a vasectomy, where is the sin in that? Where, where, where is the sin in somebody taking their body and choosing that it's 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 wise for them as their family not to have any more children? See, to be fruitful and multiply was spoken to Adam so for the purpose of populating the world in which we're in today. Everybody today don't need to be fruitful and multiply. I'm just okay. sure. I understand that, and that was the purpose in it. And I yeah. think it was Abraham. He, he, it was Abraham he spoke it to. Um, huh? I believe it was Abraham that he had spoken to. It might be Adam. I'm trying to remember. Um, but yeah, I understand what you're saying. Okay, that, God that, that would then populate the world. 
But yeah. that commandment has changed. So that's what you're saying. Yeah. The commandment right. yeah. of that was just meant multiply the earth. Okay, all right. God bless you. And uh, again, I'm not the master teacher. So if somebody got scriptures otherwise, hey, let me know. Uh, Galaxy 820, I don't know who that is. <laughs> Galaxy 820. Okay, go ahead. go ahead, brother. How are you? Hey, brother, good lesson tonight. Just want to say that. I um, yes, want to read the scripture. Uh, in Galatians 4, 27, for it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. I just want to add concerning Paul. You know, he was he was a single man, also was um, Timothy and Titus, but they were involved in a lot of births, spiritual births to the kingdom. And so, in a sense, even though they didn't have wives, they were uh, fruitful and multiplied in preaching the gospel. They bared a lot of fruit, and through that fruit, the gospel was preached, souls were saved, and there was a lot of births uh, in you know the kingdom of God. And so, when it comes to the strength that is necessary uh, and the uh, mindset, you know, for for those who are young, there's a lot of pregnancies, as you were mentioning, that are being had out of wedlock. Um, and there has to be a type of virtue and a type of, of love for God where you, the male and female, they stand up and say, well, I can't do that because it's a sin against God like Joseph did. But for some reason, uh, that's not the type of mindset that's had. And then they have sex and then they have children afterward. And then sometimes it doesn't work out. Now she's single by herself. And she may do it again. And so the idea is that you that, that mindset of loving God has to be from the heart. You know, it has to be real. And so when it comes to um, the, the communication as well, if they're quality, because right now, and I think in the U.S., there's about a 71% divorce rate, uh, which is very high, pretty much the highest in the U.S. And you have to just communicate more. You have to uh, let let individuals know where you stand with Christ and you just have to choose wisely when it comes to because remember what I think it was Rebecca uh, Rebecca and uh, was it uh, can't remember Rebecca and Isaac was it yeah I think it was Rebecca and Isaac right. mm -hmm. yeah, so they made a statement they made a statement in, uh, in the New Testament I mean the Old Testament uh, concerning the daughters of Heth in Genesis uh, 27, 46. And Rebecca said, Isaac, I am weary of my life. Genesis 27, 46. And Rebecca said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these, which are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life uh, do to me and so do me and so when it comes to to value you know Esau married those type of women and so you and he got bad quality women and the same vice versa for for women is that you can marry a man and, and you can spend years uh in going through problems and trials and then end up in divorce afterward you know so it's necessary to just um, communicate look at God's word and and because there are some that can be married to unbelievers uh, that are believers and it works out perfectly you know, and then there's some that are both believers and it works out perfectly. Both believers, it does not work out perfectly because one gets more carnal minded as the years go by. And so just just make sure that um, the person that you love is according to um, according to what you see as valuable, valuable according to what the Bible teaches. And I thank you for reading First Corinthians seven uh, verse 30, uh, 33, because those are I call them the hopscotch hopscotch uh, scriptures because they're really hopped over a lot like hopscotch first Corinthians 7 through 3 but he that is married care for the things that are of the world how you may please his wife there's difference also between a wife and a virgin the unmarried woman care for the things of the lord that she may be holy both in body and spirit that she may be married but she that is married care for the things of the world how she may please her husband and so yeah that's when it comes to even, you know, if you're married, you have to worry about th those both of those things, your wife and the kingdom, because you can get so far into the kingdom and then you don't worry about your wife and then you end up separating and divorce or on the side of 
your wife and then you just leave the kingdom alone. And there's some saints that, that have paid more attention to their wife than they left the church, went to a Baptist church, a Catholic, a Methodist, because they focus so much on their, just like Solomon, when you read, when it comes to Solomon. You know, and so, yeah, that's just a few uh, verses I wanted to give. You know, I just also want to say, uh, you know, when it comes to the comparison in Proverbs, uh, it's very similar concerning bread, eat your own bread. It's not the exact same thing when it comes to sex and eating. That would cause that would cause Paul, Timothy, and Titus to just die, you know, in the wilderness if it would be the exact same thing. But it, it is very similar according to the book of Proverbs, how it describes it. Um, but, yeah, when it comes to understanding how uh, you were made, how God made you, plus the virtue that it can give you, because that word gift in 1 Corinthians 7 is described as virtue. And what he gives, because the windows of heaven are still open for those who, who pray, um, as Matthew 19, verse 12 describes. Um, but, yeah, I just want to say good lesson, my brother. Toss it back to you. Thank you, my brother. And someone put it in the chat, uh, Genesis 9, one about the be fruitful and multiply. That was, again, another statement that was made to Noah. I don't know who put that there, but that's exactly right, because he needed to repopulate the world because the world was. And God blessed Noah and his sons, uh, Genesis 9, 1. And said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And so, again, those statements were made in uh, involving replenishing the earth. Uh, and those aren't statements that are made, you know, to you and I today to replenish the earth. OK, so I just wanted to bring that out. Anybody else? Any other point? Any other questions? Uh, Coach, yeah. Reed, you got your yeah, hand I got, yeah, I got another question. Okay. Now, you know, um, in the world, there's a lot of what they called um, dating coaches and stuff. And they got like a lot of information that they like to put out there. Some of it is false. And I think a lot of people look to these so-called dating coaches. You can find them on YouTube, social media, or whatever. It's like a big thing now in this modern day and time. They have certain teachings like, oh, um, um, soul ties and what else again? Genera generational curses. Um, and one teaching that they have that I wanted to ask a question about is that they mentioned that after a relationship, just about every one of them would say this, Brother Stevens, after a relationship, you have to have time to heal. You have to have time to heal. Now, I'm trying to examine this and I'm trying to compare it to what I see in the scriptures. And I go to the story in the book, I believe it's either Samuel 1 or Samuel 2. And it talks about a guy named Nabal. He had a wife named Abigail. Abigail was on point. She was a righteous, holy, virtuous like woman. She was a godly woman. But her husband, Nabal, awful. He would, he would, he would be what you would call a modern day Pookie and Ray Ray. You know, at least what, that's what they'll call him. He was just awful, wasn't a good guy, you know, was just a wicked person. He ended up dying. He ended up passing away. We know the story. He ended up passing away. And immediately, I see Abigail and David married. They didn't, you know, it, I don't see no time lapse or anything. It's like they transition right over to it. Now, healing and anything like that, like most dating coaches would say, you got time, you need time to heal. I don't see none of that going on. Now, I examine that and I say to myself, I don't know if I want to heal if I have a woman of God right before me because you can't really find that like the Bible says. Who can find a virtuous woman? The odds of you finding that is very slim. You know, I've been in this world for about 42 years and <clears throat> haven't met that many, you know, and I'm pretty sure vice versa, the virtuous man, if that's such the case, I believe so. There are godly men out there and I believe the women on the chat can attest to it as well. It's hard to find a godly man. So I wanted to know what's your position concerning the Bible on healing after getting out of a, you know, a jacked up relationship, because I don't see that. Every, every, case, is David. Every, well, every case is different, Brother Val Sant. I mean, mm -hmm. every case, I mean, we have, we judge cases. So there is no one blanket policy for everybody. Some people do need time to heal and may want time to heal after loss of a loved one. Uh, Abigail knew she was married to a fool. That's what his name means. He was a fool. That's why she went to David. She, she told him, I know he's a fool. Yeah, she knew that. And God's the one that killed uh, killed Nabal. That's in 1 Samuel 25. God killed him. 
And uh, and so everybody knew he was a fool. So David comes along and, and they got married. But what I want you to what I'm saying is every case is different. There's nothing if you wrong if you do. Some people are like, yeah, may grieve and and can live single and, and never want another spouse. I love him or her so much that there is nobody, you know, that can fill that void. And I'm happy with my relationship with God. And I can stay single. There's no sin either way. And so that's that's I'm hoping we understand and we grasp that. OK, but if somebody died and then somebody got married right after that, there's no sin in that either. Nobody can say, oh, you sin, uh, but you got married quick. You must didn't love. I mean, you, you can't judge that. God judges that. So we got to just stay away, you know, from doctrinal. I mean, again, from I'm not from 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 worldly doctrine is really what I want to say. And just understand every individual is different. OK, and that's just all we can say. And, you know, you're not wrong if your husband or wife died today and you got married Saturday. I mean, my goodness, oh, you can move on that quick, then move on. You know, as long as you know you're right with the Lord, that's all that matters. OK. All right. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah, right. brother drive again. OK, brother Leroy. Hey, look okay. here. I'm going to celebrate my 44th anniversary on Friday. Hey man, congratulations. So, I brother, to God bless you. Friday, so God bless uh, you. Yeah. So I want y'all to know that. And you know that marriage has been something's up and downs. We have ups, we have downs. That's right. And that's gonna happen in any marriage. Ain't Amen. nobody's marriage gonna be perfect. Amen. It's not gonna be. That's right. Work. And I, but I'm grateful, you know, for the wife I have, and hopefully we have many more. Yeah. Amen. Well, congratulations, brother. 44 years. You and the wife. Praise God. We thank God for you, brother. Thank God for your marriage and your example. Uh, brother Kennedy. Oh, yes. Real quick, brother Simpson. The only thing I wanted to um, I wanted to leave off was saying with to tie into what he was saying about all these coaches and all these people out here giving, over, like, giving advice on relationship. Um, we have to encourage our kids um, to date but be able to teach them and have, and be able to um, utilize wisdom when what they are doing in that dating process, because, you know, the dating, you're collecting data. And, and, you know, when, when, when the scripture tells us that, that when a man finds a, a woman, he finds a good thing. You could only find that if you are out there looking um, for that woman, but you have to go through a process. And, and, and the problem is, and I know my wife can speak of this and, I mean, I, I didn't have no no mentorship in this process either. We don't. Oftentimes, we're we 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 allow our kids to experience things out there and don't properly prepare them. And then you know you end up finding somebody who's over experienced that's going to cheat your child. Um, and and so you have to guide them and encourage them and let them know what it is that they're looking for in that data collection process of finding somebody who is compatible with them in order and, and, and to, you know, stay away from fornicating and, and getting into those pitfalls, because if not, yes, you do have a lot of, um, of, uh, of PhDs from YouTube people who are giving a lot of, of, of guidance on what they should be doing. And, and it's contrary to what the Bible is. Amen. God bless you. All right. Anyone else? Thank you all for the advice. All right, Saints. Thank you all so much for being part of these Kingdom Family Studies. Again, thank you. If you're on here, you're not a member of the church. I'm going to just say this. We, we want you to ask your question and ask that all important question. What must you do to be saved? Uh, none of these lessons in and of themselves are going to get you and I into the kingdom of heaven unless you obey the gospel. Uh, it's all about Jesus and your relationship with him. You need to hear that he died for you, buried on the third day he rose. Believe it with all your heart, mind, and soul. Be willing to repent. Uh, repent of your sins. Repent is a change of mind, which leads to a change of action. OK, it's a 180 degree turn in your thinking and in your lifestyle. Realize and say, hey, I've sinned. And then you simply confess with your mouth, not your sin. You confess that you believe Jesus, the son of God, He died. He died for your sin. That's the confession. I believe he is the son of God, that his body uh, bore my sins in it. And because of him, I can be saved. And Jesus said, in order to receive the spirit and to receive that salvation, you get baptized in water for the remission of your sins. We baptize on any day that ends with why. I want to say that again. We baptize on any day that ends with why. No matter what time of day, we'll do it all we can to put the right man in your in place to have you dipped in water where you say, I believe Jesus died, buried, and rose. And in the water by faith, Jesus will perform an operation on your soul. And you cannot be taught wrong and baptized right. Underst please understand that. Yeah, a lot of people say they've been baptized before, but they've been baptized by the wrong person and with the wrong doctrine. 
So you must be baptized right. That means taught right, okay? And then once you're baptized, Acts 2.38 and following, uh, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Acts 2.47, the Lord will add. You don't join Christ's church. The Lord will add you to the people of God, the church that you can read about in your Bible, okay? If we can assist you in any in that way, or if you got more questions on that, we would love uh, to spend time with you in that area. Brother Kenny, you still have your hand up or it just left up? Okay, okay. If nothing else, and uh, Brother Claude, do you mind giving us a closing prayer, my brother, please? Shall we pray? My precious Father, we come before you at this time. We come as humble as we know how. We come giving you thanks, Father, for the for the lesson that we received this night. We come, Father, that we have a clear understanding of your word. We come, Father, thanking you for the teacher who patiently explained your word. Thank you, Father, for your son. We thank you for his death. We thank you for what he died for. We thank you for the love that you have to allow this to happen. Father, we thank you for these things. Father, we know that we cannot do anything without you because you are our creator. Father, without you, we can do nothing. We can't think for ourselves sometimes, Father. We have to have you. Father, we ask that you be with our sick and shut in, that you will be with them. ones that may have problems, may have body problems, mental problems. Father, we ask that you would ease their pains and would be your holy will, that you would get them, Father, and keep them safe. Be with their providers and caretakers, that they will attend to them with love and understanding, as they provide medication for them, Father. Father, we thank you for this world. We thank you for this dying generation, Father, that in somehow, in some way, that our little lights might shine to bring them unto you, Father. That we'll be able to touch their souls, their hearts. Father, we, we know that you would not work, don't want any of us to pass without knowing you. Oh, Father, thank you for this opportunity to come before you. To thank you for this day a day in which we will never see again, Father. We ask that, Father, that through your love, the things that we have done today, that you would forgive us if we have committed sin or if we have slipped, Father, or if we have caused the one to stumble. Father, we, we ask that you would forgive us and I hold these sins against us and cast them into a sea of forgetfulness where they will not rise to condemn us before you just fall. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your understanding. We thank you for allowing the Holy Spirit to guide and to live within us, Father. We thank you. We thank you for who you are and what you mean to us. We thank you for these things, Father. And in your son's name, we pray that this week will be a better week for us. That this day have been a good day for us and that tomorrow will be better if it be your holy will that we will rise to see it. These things we ask in your son's name, Father, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you, Brother Claude. Saints, I'll leave y'all Romans 16, 16, the Church of Christ salutes you. Love y'all. Have a good day. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.